Okay. All right, welcome, guys. We're here at the uh, Fictionalizing yeah. Reality panel. I'm really glad to see everybody. Oh, oh, okay, let's try that again. Uh -huh. Hi, um, welcome to Fictionalizing Reality. Really happy to have you here today. Um, with me are four really terrific creators. We have uh, Joris Bassbacker with his book Kisses for Jet. Um, we have Audra Stang, who is the author of The Audra Show, among other stories set in the fictional Star Valley. Uh, we have Jared Green, who is the author of AOK, -OK, and Coco Fox, author of Right to Left. So I think we can just jump right in with a few questions for you guys. Um, my first question is probably the most basic one. It's why, why not flat memoir if you're going to be uh, attacking, or not attacking, but uh, looking at your own experiences? Why, why have you decided to um, fictionalize this? What, does, what benefits does that afford you? And uh, does that tether carry any significant downsides? I guess I'll do, I'll do it. Oh, ooh, that's weird. Um, <laughs> I mean, I guess because like, I think more about like the emotional accuracy than the, I don't know, do I look forward or do I look at you? Uh, but it's, it's like, um, I'm really aiming more for emotional accuracy than literal accu accuracy. Um, and I have obsessive compulsive disorder, so I think it's really easy to get like caught up. Like when I do, um, like I did a comic for Imperial Egg that was straight autobio, and I found myself getting really caught up on like insignificant details because I wanted it to be accurate. And I think with autobio, it's really easy to get into like, oh, this one, one thing, or like I want to represent somebody accurately, but that's literally impossible because memory is inaccurate. But if I'm striving for emotional accuracy, then I can construct something that might not be literal in any way, but it feels the same way. For me, I, I started um, with memoir. I like did a whole outline and like synopsis of my book as a memoir, and I felt like there were just a lot of details that were um, sort of unnecessary in things I was cutting out, and then it was just easier to tweak things and and just go more in a fictional direction, and it just felt more it, again like yeah the emotional truth. Yeah. there and like I was just getting to the core of what I wanted to say a little easier um, and I, I don't know there was something freeing about it too knowing that it was you know came from somewhere real but then just made into a slightly better story that uh, wouldn't be bogged down with details that were maybe like kind of boring after a while. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, for me I actually am doing a memoir but because it's set in the sixth grade a lot of the characters we're so young that the sort of side characters have been fictionalized yeah. because it's sort of a consent thing. But um, I made that's made it so much easier to get to like the true emotions, like Audra was saying, of the situation versus worrying too much about exactly what every sixth grader in my class looked like. Yeah, you know, that kind exactly. of thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I really relate to what you guys are saying because it was also a process. I started out with like a memoir, literally writing what I experienced and then just kind of got a bit stuck with that where I wasn't able to tell what I wanted to tell and the most important thing was the emotional um, thing that I, I had a very strong feel like memories of feelings that I experienced as a kid and I wanted those feelings to, to bring those feelings across um, and it just became more like easy to, to get a dramatic story if I changed things or added things and um, I think there's like the way truth works is that sometimes there'd be like two or three people and you turn them into one person yes. and that kind of yeah. thing. Yeah. So it sounds like we can all kind of come to a consensus that fictionalizing memoir or personal experience really comes down to flattening um, you know, chaotic, random, true events into a story, like something with coherence and ostensibly with a purpose, right? Um, that said, arguably all fiction has some basis in personal experience. Um, so where do you perceive that line? Like where does it cease to be flat fiction and become fictionalized reality? Yeah. I mean, I, I think that there's, there's that thing where you make different characters, but then probably there's a little bit of you in, in, in every, yeah. <laughs> everything and in the whole book. So it's, it's like a real jumble in the end. Yeah, I mean, like I uh, like in my stuff, I dabble into like some sci-fi things, and you know, like that could be, um, 
how do I put it? Like, I like magical realism, and like, the thing that's really cool about magical realism is that like, you might have something that's like, not literally happening, but it is literally happening, and so it's like this, how do I put it? Like, this supernatural thing is like real, but unreal at the same time. Um, so it's like a character like, having gills and like, not wanting someone to see their gills could like, be emotionally accurate to like maybe something you don't want somebody to see about yourself or you know um so that's i think that's kind of where i'm at with it like the more fantastic elements in my stuff i think uh for me i um the where it sort of started to become like fictionalized was i i had like two sort of major timelines from my life so one was sort of in the end of high school and one was um eighth grade and so then joining those things together um it i guess the it felt started to feel like okay this has to be fiction because i'm using stuff that happened to me in high school but i'm like changing it to work in middle school and so yeah. uh, and then like uh, yours was saying with the combining characters it just feels like it's multiple personality traits of different people but then sort of figuring out this new character that sort of hits certain points in the story that that are needed so i don't feel like i could say that that was Um, for me, I'm writing a story about uh, basketball, and so when it comes down to actually pushing the sort of drama and story forward, I mean, I looked up the actual scores of the games, but that was definitely a, like, I don't really remember what happened that long ago, and so I found that adding elements of fiction to sort of the side details that don't matter, that's been really helpful just to make sure the beats are right, and they're kind of pushing forward this anxiety for the characters. Um, but I, it's kind of freeing to see uh, a lot of autofiction coming out because sort of when people write about it at the end, you can kind of see their thought process on what, what was real, what wasn't, and like why they made those changes. I like it. Yeah, and going off of that too, you know, I think that like when you're writing about your own experiences, you have to think about like, what's for my own benefit and what's for the audience's benefit yes. because it's really easy to get like navel gazy and it's kind of like, I really have to be honest with myself, like would a reader give a shit about this? Does this add to the story? Does this move anything forward? And if it doesn't, then it's like, it was fun for me to explore um, because I'm sure like everybody here, like when you're doing this stuff, you're working through like old things or maybe it's like, child like things I haven't revisited since I was like 14 and then it's like turned and I'm looking at it as a 30 year old woman and it's like oh wow sorry I need to like lean into the microphone but um yeah that that too yeah yeah and I think like reality is super complex and super messy and it's just you like one of the challenges like how am I even going to turn this into like a 200 page book or into a short story because yeah. it's so complex and um, I think that's like, because I do want to show that reality is complex, actually. I don't want to turn it into something which is simple. I think it's about, like, I think there's like a beauty in seeing, like, how can we make, like, complexity um, understandable and readable. Um, but there, that's kind of like the puzzle of turning that complexity into something that's readable. Yeah. Well, actually, uh, several of you touched on a question I was going to ask later, but I'm going to ask it now instead. And that has to do with composites. So I noted that um, Joris and Jared both spoke about composite characters. Um, so for Audra and Coco as well, um, have you created any composite characters that you know represent multiple real life individuals? And um, for all of you, why, why did you choose this route or why didn't you? Um, I mean, I guess sort of like, Yours was saying where it's like showing how complex reality is because it goes both ways. Like, I mean, there's some characters where it might be like three like different, like, I mean, a lot of my characters are just like me from like three different points in my life. But then like some, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's like, it goes both ways. And then, you know, sort of like Coco was saying with like remembering your friends from sixth grade or whatever, like it's just like, like it's like just sometimes it's just easier to have like one like a mom you know what I mean um but I mean a lot of it goes back to like the overall story I'm telling and like how helpful it is to have this you know if that makes sense it makes perfect sense I think for me it, there was a part where I um I 
have a lot of characters because I, and I wanted it to feel like complicated and you know you have a lot of friends and all the friend groups don't always like overlap but then my editor was like you have this one character who kind of disappears by the middle of the story and then this other one that like comes up because they're in a different class and they're up through the end can't that be the same character and then you can just sort of streamline like and there's not like a new person coming in or somebody dropping off and it's just confusing for the reader so it was more um, like helpful and, and clear in the story to just like make it into one person and just tweak, tweak those scenes a little bit. I would find that edit so aggravating. Like that's like, like that's how real life is though. Like I'd be yeah. like, nah, like people drop off and show up in real life. That's the, like, you know, I don't know. It's, well, it's kind of like Craig, like Craig Bartlett who made Hey Arnold. Like they really didn't want them to go with like the drunk mom storyline. And he was like, no, like I think kids can figure it out, you know, so. I don't know. I'm sorry you got that edit. <laughs> oh, I, they honestly didn't bother me. I thought oh, it, I there, because there were already a lot of characters, so it yeah. felt like it was a little getting a little unruly. And and then it's one less character to have to design and like keep track of and have in the background. So I felt like it was I was pretty okay with it. And at that point, a lot was like fictionalized, so yeah. I felt like it, it was not a big deal. Well, on the point of oh, I'm sorry, Coco, were you gonna? Oh yeah. yeah. Um, the streamlining characters thing is a hard one. I almost feel like instead of just streamlining characters, it's like who's getting the spotlight more has been like the troubling thing of like, does it serve the story to have a background on nine people? Like, is that really what we need even though it's true? So it's been helpful having like editors to sort of be like, what is serving your purpose of the character and what they're trying to grow towards? Um, so it's not really fictionalizing it, but it's definitely focusing on different elements of the truth. So. Do you all have editors? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Do you have an editor? Uh, depends on what. So like for a book with a publisher, there's an editor. But then if I do like zines or like short stories, sometimes, sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. I actually, I love working with editors. Oh, but I think it's a style thing. Like some, I love like campy art. And yeah. especially like if I'm doing a zine or a short story, I might want to lean into that more. And then it's like really fun to not, to, to have that thing. Like, yeah. oh, this character just disappears. and. <laughs> you might not get it and that, that that's more yeah. what it's about like it's it's not all something that you might want and then sometimes with a book that's like with a publisher and there's like selling you want that kind of readability yeah yeah where nobody kind of has any doubts but i i, I don't think it needs to always be there yeah i love yeah. doubts i love ambiguity i feel like that's like where the space between the reader and the art like i don't know i love that back and forth like mm. you know sorry no, that's I, great um well uh, it, speaking of editors and you know self-editing. Um, for those of you who had editors, how much uh, sway did the editors ultimately have over determining which events you kept? That, the events, uh, I think Coco said, um, the ones that move the story forward. Um, and you know, I mean, that's always necessarily a ton of shaving down, right? Because you're taking real life and, and smoothing it out. Um, but did you find this, like additionally, did you find that more frustrating or kind of liberating, would you say? Uh, for me, liberating. I, I definitely had some scenes that just were sort of random memories, um, but it, it's helpful to have someone else's eyes on it who didn't have that lived experience or uh, like a fictionalized lived experience because it's really hard when you're so deep in your book to see what, what isn't serving the story. I mean, I, I could say that phrase a million times because that's what my editor said. <laughs> but uh, I found that really, really helpful, just outside eyes. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I felt like there were points where I couldn't see the forest for the trees and like the editor, because I would send like a completed draft and then my editor would read the full, um, full book so it wasn't like in sections or anything. Yeah. And yeah, he would just, you know, he's on the lookout for like what's confusing and I may be piecing things together in my head, but he's like, oh, I'm, I'm yes. confused. What are you saying here? What is, what is going on? And um, yeah, I felt like he really helped, like Coco was saying, like, focus, focus the book, make sure like the point is coming across and nothing is confusing. Because I don't want anything to be confusing. But um, I think working with a, a good editor, they, uh, I always feel like I'm in the driver's seat and there were, there were things where I'm like, no, I don't agree for reasons X, Y, and Z. And like, this is why I want this in the story. And then he's helping me sort of make sure that that's clear and that's coming across. So we're always um, getting on the same page, I feel like. And we're, we have the same goal of like making the same book ultimately. Um, I don't have an editor um, with this. I didn't show it to anybody and I put it out and I'm just like, 
I was kind of nervous because I didn't show it to anybody, but then it was okay. Um, I don't know, I, I feel like I have a clear, I shouldn't say I have a clear idea of what I'm doing, but I feel like I do, um, so. But I don't know, sometimes it, it helps. If there's something where I'm really not sure, I'll like show it to a friend or something, but I, have, I, I don't have an editor, so. Um, so before I did comics, I worked in the visual arts, and in the, like, the contemporary art scene, I think there's kind of a, like a holiness around the author, and it's a bit taboo to work together with people. Um, so I really love like the comic scene where it's like you know it's it's okay if there's things that you don't know, and then you get you do it as a team, or you get someone to help you with that thing that you can't do. Um, and so I really really love that. And this was the first time I did a long story, and I really needed to just figure out how that technically worked. I just wasn't figuring it out. So I I, I had an editor just turn it like help me structure a story. Um, but now, now, like working, wanting to make another large story, um, I'm protective over kind of shaping it first. I want to be like quite far ahead, um, so that once somebody helps me, um, because I'm, I, I love edits. I'm impressionable, and um, I, I, um, I think everything's a great idea. So I want to make sure that I have. Um, it's set for myself everything that I want to be in there um, so that I can do a lot of like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I don't, so I don't want to work too soon with an editor right now. But at, when I was working on this, um, I had just a lot of loose material and um, I just really needed that help to, yeah. to turn it into a book. Yeah. That's great, you guys. Um, just going to backtrack a little bit back to um, the tail end of our composite character speech. Um, have you ever worried about repercussions when it comes to representing others' real life experiences in your book? Yeah. And have you had any con uh, experience seeking consent from those that you're representing? And really, do you feel it necessary um, given your own storytelling decisions? And like, why or why not? I can speak on this. I recently talked to someone who's in my book. Almost all the young people have been changed but one, I realized that their name rhymed with the real person's name, and I was like, okay, subconscious, hey. Um, but I had to talk to them about it, and they were so glad that I talked to them about it, and I kind of like gave them such a heads up that it worked out, but I think it's pretty important um, because they would really know it was about them. Um, but a lot of the other ones, that don't have many actions in the story, I've had less of a worry about doing it. I don't know about all you. I, I wasn't as concerned when I was combining characters because so much was changing. I had a similar thing though where a name would felt too similar to yeah. me. And then and I I think originally they weren't combined with the character and so then when I combined them together I changed the name again. Uh, I had to change it throughout the whole edit. My editor's like, wait, is this the name of this character? It was kind of confusing, but I felt like it was too similar to the real person, but it was so different from who they were, so I was like, I'm not too concerned about it. And I feel like my family is pretty close to like the family in the book, um, but they've always joked about me writing a memoir about them. <laughs> so they were they were fine with it. So it was all good there. Um, I've never, I don't think I've asked for anybody's consent because sort of like Coco was saying, like the stuff I've done that's really expressly autobio is like. They're like background people, you know, so it's kind of like, it doesn't matter. Um, I did this one comic called Pale Sick and Magic that was about um, my senior year of high school. My friend drove his car into a lake um, and he was missing for a week. Um, and when they found him, it was the same day that like Osama bin Laden got murdered. So like, yeah, so it's like when people talk about that, like I have like no memory of that. Um, so I did this comic where it follows the week that this kid is missing and like it very explicitly is like on the same timeline. Um, and I did have anxiety about people who were there when that happened reading it um, because there's two there's like two girl characters in the story. One of them's kind of like a popular preppy girl that bullied this other like weird girl, you know? And and I, I don't know if like guys get this as much, but like maybe, or yeah, I guess everybody does, where it's like, is that you? Are you the girl? Like, which girl are you? So I actually did draw myself into that comic um, because in real life we had this vigil and I like was crying at the vigil. I was like, he shared his sandwiches at me and lunch, you know. So I drew like a girl giving the speech, wearing the outfit that I was wearing, so that if anybody read it, they'd be like, it's like a background character. She's like two panels, but like 
I'm not either of those girls because I'm standing right there giving the sandwich speech, you know. And with the uh, with the Audra show stuff, like I think people who knew me would like very easily be like, oh, like that's so and so and that's so and so. But it's kind of like I feel like I have proprietary ownership over my memories, you know. So I, I you know, I don't know. That's how I feel about it. Yeah. Sorry. I mean, I do. I do worry. I I, I worry a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Um, when I started working on this, I, I didn't know anybody was really going to read it. Um, I, I didn't have a publisher when I started. I like, was looking for a publisher when I finished. So um, there was a lot. I, like, I, I really wasn't thinking about that, and I did worry about that later. I mean, I did change everybody's kind of the way they look, and, and not everybody is an actual person and stuff. Um, but um, in the end, I think everybody that might recognize themselves can also recognize that it's not them and that there's differences. Yeah. Um, yeah um, I am like the next work I'm going to work on is going to be a complete fiction because I, I, um, I think it's, it's, I've noticed it's changed during my life. So when I was younger, like I wanted to be super explicit and I thought like, Creating drama my work was being super, super honest, and that was really fun when I was young, and people weren't really reading my work. Yeah. Um, but just getting older, and I have like a kid now, and that just changed my, I'm more, way more protective about my uh, privacy, and then also transitioning was something that I did when I already had a book, when I had work out, and it made me also, like it was such a, dramatic thing in my private life that I became way more protective about my private life. It, it just changed me. Um, and But it's fun because I've been like experimenting with like, what do you say, magic realism yeah. and, um, and want to experiment with fiction. And I feel like every time I make a work, I want to try out new genres. So it's it's not, a, not an issue. Like but, So for me, like autobio, like really fit also this kind of being young and f feeling a bit radical. I think yeah. it's very yeah. like it's like a very it's like a tightrope kind of because it's like you don't want to give anybody the short end of the stick but then it's also really tempting to make the characters that are based off of me get the short end of the stick yes. and like that's not good either it, it's like because it's the same thing like it doesn't serve the reader if anything it's just gonna make them like weirdly uncomfortable <laughs> but it, but that's also like not how real life works you know um and so it's like, yeah, it's like, I can't give myself the stick, I can't give them the stick, you know? And I do worry about people reading it and being like, ah, oh, I think that was me and I was a huge bitch, but I feel like, you know, the Audra characters are, everybody's a huge bitch. <laughs> I'm sorry. Are we allowed to, I just realized, are we allowed to swear? I hope so. Yeah, I, I, I fucking hope so. I mean, shit. <laughs> All right. Let's I, Um, so, you know, kind of touching on some of those themes, um, one thing among many that I appreciate about this particular lineup is that you all have a pretty distinct way that you interact with um, your personal stand-in, right? Like, I, I essentially want to hear more about your relationship with your protagonist. Um, some of you are telling your story through the eyes of a character who is clearly a pretty thinly veiled version <laughs> of yourself. I, I have to say, Jared, I really appreciate Jay. Violet, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, no relation to Jerry Green <laughs> <laughs> whatsoever. Close, yeah. um, what what fueled, uh, Audrey you touched on this some, but like what fueled your decision to um, I engage with that part of yourself the way you did? I think sort of saying what going off what Audrey was saying. Um, I, I I was always thinking like how do I um, uh, just the phrase like slice of life like I wanted to feel as real as possible even though it's like. so much like room to develop everything um, but I, I feel like I didn't want him to like have all the answers or, or you know always coming out on top just like I don't know it, it was um, what am I trying to say here uh, <laughs> um, yeah I, I just I never wanted it to feel like he was like too smart for the situation I was just really trying to channel like back then like what did I actually know and like know about myself like he has a little more like confidence than I probably did at that time, but other than that, it was really about like how do I capture that period of time in my life and not give him too much knowledge from the future and like just I don't know have him breezing through the book too easily. Well, 
Well, that was for everybody, though. Yeah, that was for everybody. Um, you were saying how we engage with, like, ourselves. Yeah. 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 That's a good way to put it. Um, I mean, yeah. You know, it's like, that's, that's interesting. Actually, I want to think about it for a second if somebody else sure. wants to go. Um, yeah. I, I found it on mine. Um, I found that it's much easier to, my, I have a pen name, which is Coco, so it's so much easier to kind of talk about the character, even though it's totally me, um, to like give her as much flaws and like problems as possible when it's like a little bit removed. Um, so I found that way easier to make it like, even though it is you, it's the, ca the character can have so much more growth in that time period that, again, now, not the same issues, but um, it's it's been really helpful. I had like issues like showing that my character sometimes my editors helped me like recognize that my character was sometimes not showing enough emotion because it's this thing like you're seeing it through your own eyes, so y you know what your emotions are. And my editor kept reminding me like, no, you got to now show what you're feeling because <laughs> the reader is not going to know. And it, apparently, it's like a typical mistake to make if you're writing from your own perspective um, that you're just kind of showing what you see. Um, when, so my first languages are English and Dutch, and um, I started writing in English, um, but then because I live in Germany and I was looking for uh, German funding and German publishers, I started writing in German at a certain point, and which is, I've lived there for 20 years, but it's not my first language, it's not my emotional language. Um, and it turned out to be really nice because um, it was much easier to write in this language that wasn't my emotional language, um, because it was part, like, sometimes pretty personal, heavy stuff to write about. And um, I thought I wouldn't be able to do that in German, but it was like a really nice distance to do that. Yeah. Wow, that's really, that's really cool. Yeah, I didn't that say I, yeah. I, I'm not totally, I, I can speak Spanish in the present tense. I'm kind of like, I wonder, like, I kind of want to try writing a comic and not my native language now. But I guess the, the, the question you're asking, I was struggling with it because I feel like I really have two characters that are like my like avatar character. Um, I have like this character named Adelaide who's like a 14 year old girl and then I have a character named Owen who um, he's in his 20s and like the storyline I've worked with him with so much and I feel like Adelaide is like me in the past. I feel like Owen is more me in the present and then like when those characters engage with each other it's kind of like like, I don't know if anybody's, like, familiar with, like, uh, internal family systems. Um, it's a type of therapy where basically it's, like, you have, like, a family inside yourself and, like, your present self might be the parent and you might interact with, like, your younger self and you're revisiting your, like, past memories as an adult. And so I guess I, it's funny because I, I was working on this before I ever knew what IFS is. I learned of that from Sacha Mardu's autobio comics, which are really good. Um, but I realized, like... That's sort of what's, I think Starvelli is kind of like that for me. It's like my internal family system. And yeah, I would say Owen is probably like the character that I'm like active with and Adelaide's like my passive avatar character. And like Adelaide also is like my mom too. Like, I don't know, you know, it just gets messy, you know, it just gets, yeah, but. <laughs> So yeah, that kind of sounds like what comic writing is. Sometimes, yeah. sometimes I, I remember like as a kid when I was you're like playing house or you have like yeah, dolls and it's, it's just like, playing with like, dolls. What are they gonna wear? And yeah. then they talk to each other and it's like <laughs> it's what you get to do as like a comic artist. Yeah, yeah. yeah. For sure. Yours, I really liked um, that uh, observation you made about your ability to get a little more emotional distance when you're writing a language that's not your own. And I think that's so interesting that you're engaging that analytical part of your brain to remove yourself a little bit from the emotion, right? Um, just to clean up the mess. And I'm wondering if the rest of you guys have any similar tactics you use to kind of pull yourself out of the moment and into a space where you can create something coherent out of it. Um, I mean, I make a lot of material and then I pare it down. Um, you know, I think that's like the way to or I don't know actually, because everybody's process is different, so I don't believe in like the way. But for me, my way is um, I write all I write a lot of material, and then I pare that down. I might actually, if any the rehear if anybody has seen the rehearsal, uh, or there, he makes like a flow chart for like every scenario that could possibly happen, and that's like I draw out like every scenario that could happen, and then it's like I can make that into the best version and the most concise version of the thing. I think that answered the question. Yeah. Yeah. Good. There we that's go. That's a solid answer. I guess it's kind of similar to what I was saying earlier, like working in drafts, I guess. Like I'm, 
I kind of go through with, without my editor's input and just do what I think is best for the story, covering all the ground I think is necessary, all the emotional beats, and then, um, you know, talking with him about what is or isn't working or what's not clear, and then me going through, and like, sometimes he points something out, and I'm like, oh yeah, I skipped over something, or I need to change the scene for some reason, and um, it's always about like honing, I don't know, honing in on what I'm trying to say and making it as clear as possible. Actually, I should ask if you, do you, so like my drafts I, are like, I draw them, like I, I draw, because I know some people are very text-based, and so I'm curious if you're text, you know, text or drawing based, because we're talking about drafts, but you know, like everybody's drafts look very different, yeah. I have, I've been told I have very tight thumbnails. Yes, <laughs> you do. Them, you know? <laughs> They're like uh, pencils. It's like a pencil version of the whole book. <laughs> okay, basically. cool. Yeah. Uh, I have to see what it's like visually. And yeah, same, um, same. See all the like, if, like emotions on the character's face and like get a sense of like how the scene is playing. I don't know how people do script driven. I could. I mean, yeah, respect, I but like, no. <laughs> I wish I could because it seems faster, but no, I have to see it. Probably. Yeah. Okay. Mine is both of your worst nightmare. Um, <laughs> so I like write it fully prose. There's this class called the 90 Day Novel, and they randomly like uh, have uh, discounts and stuff. So I try and sign up for it like when um, they have a discount, and you basically just have to finish the novel in 90 days. And so I wrote this as prose first, just to like get the kinks out. I think yeah. I just needed to like understand w who I'm talking about, what they care about, everything, like how it ends before I started drawing. Um, and I found that to be so easy uh, because what was weird was when I wrote it, it wasn't very good, so I could just kind of toss it out and then write the script of the thumbnails. Yeah. Like, but just to know the characters more before I start drawing them, it helped me make so many better decisions for like what their, everyone's um, arc would be. So yeah, separation. I do do a, so a written synopsis though. I, mm. I work from a synopsis and turn that into thumbnails as I'm like writing scenes. So yeah. I have like the, the outline of essentially of the whole story. Yeah. I don't think I have like one method like that. <laughs> I think it's like the, like while writing it, I'm tr I try out different things. Yes, and yeah, then I'm, yeah. I try out different things and different things and kind of go back and forth and I don't know. Yeah. I don't think any two projects are ever done the same. No. I don't think I've ever That's worked true. exactly the same way every time. So. Okay. I feel like even with like a scene sometimes like if I feel myself getting like really semantics -y, I, I will I will write I will just write it over and over again. But then with a lot of stuff I just draw the actions. I don't even know what the words are going like actually yeah sometimes I literally will write like I'll draw it and then I'll just write like joke setup, joke punchline, <laughs> and, and I'll do it like later in the finished drawing. Yeah, because like the yeah. timing's there, I'm just like, fuck, I have to come up with a joke to put in there. <laughs> well, yeah, sometimes yes. it's funny, like even getting edits back, it's like, oh, I need to change the scene or add, a, I, I can't just add like a page because it'll push all the page turns yes. of things. So I feel like, like I'd be an editor's worst nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> well, so then it's like, okay, I have two pages or three pages that I'm trying to fix, and it's like, how do I make the scene work yeah. in this new like, frame of, three pages or two pages or yeah. you know, inserting a new yeah. scene that has to be two or four pages. Oh yeah, I know what you're like talking that. about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the physical. I love that though. It's like, cause it's like, uh, like paper, what is it? God, who, I don't know. But like somebody would call comics like paper jazz or whatever, because you have your, <laughs> yeah. you have your one limitation, like, you know, you have your one limitation, then you're operating off of that. And yeah, it's, it's also why I really like, like the, like I like the, like, I have like my set for, you know, like, Six panel. I'm doing this whole thing six panel, and that's my limitation. And then I can just like yeah. all around yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, it's like modular. You can. Modular. Yeah, I do. I do really like the limitation of like the physical book. Um, yes. That really helps because you know. Yeah. Yeah, great. I I love the constraints. Of yeah, <laughs> of please. You know. <laughs> Audrey, I just want you to know that I just wrote down paper jazz with three <laughs> lines and everything. That's so I good. I think it's from comic. I think it's a comics comics. It's, but I'm not sure. You'd have to look it up. It's going to yeah. stick in my head forever. But just to jump back to another comment you made earlier, I made a note about um, I, when we were talking about paring down the experience to, as you put it, um, what's, what's for you, the creator, and what's for the audience. Um, what purpose did telling this specific story serve for you? Personally, I think for me, like, um, I mean, I've been making comics since I was a teenager, and I feel like it's it's a way of like how I sort of remember experiences or like 
organize my thoughts about how I feel about something and um, sometimes I don't know like where it comes from that initial like I just feel like I have to write this story for whatever reason and I had done a mini comic version that was a memoir before I did this book uh, and I just felt like I had to had to do it and it was very different from the thing I had just done and um, I don't know just yeah it's like uh, going with my intuition and like just yeah, how to do it. <laughs> I understand better now why I didn't see stuff that I could relate to when I was younger. Um, you know, like, I remember, like, kids would read those, like, click, they were called the click, yes. and, like, the poor character in the click wore Keds, but, like, I couldn't afford Keds, <laughs> um, and it was, like, whenever I saw characters in books and stuff that I could relate to, I was almost always a joke character, um, and so I was just, like, I just want to make stories about, like, you know, like, I've been making comics since I was, like, five or six years old, so it's always just been, like, I just wanted to make stuff that I didn't see, um, you know, because it was harder. Like, I I remember, like, I was in the public library, I was looking for manga, and I found um, Lauren Weinstein's girl stories, and, like, that, I, I held on to that for years, and I tried to find stuff like that for years, and, I mean, um, I shouldn't say now it's easier, because I think even a young person now, like, would maybe have a difficulty finding that stuff, um, you know, but it's like... Uh, I just, I don't know. I didn't feel like anybody was making stories about me that I liked, so I wanted to do that, you know. I think for me, like, uh, making comics is how I communicate with the world in general. Like, so, so if, if, like, life is messy and complicated and then I, li I like to clean up in my life, then comics is a way of cleaning up and, like, tidying up my head and understanding my thoughts, but also it's an easier way for me to communicate with people um, like it's nicer to be up here and to have this all these like that this completely organized who sits where and who says what and when and then also through a book than to like the chaos of like a party <laughs> yeah. and the no rules so I, I love like that there's this book and that's the way I communicate um, yeah. um, but uh, I was gonna say something else um, yeah also the the re I think a lot of artists start out with an autobiography um, before they get on to writing other work, this, because it's just very normal to be traumatized by your youth, I think. It's just a very, yeah. like, it's growing up is traumatized. <laughs> Becoming an adult is like a traumatizing transformation Absolutely. in itself. Um, there's a lot to understand there. And um, when I started writing this, it was just about identity in general. So I grew up in living in various countries, and I just thought, like, I, identity was a very complicated thing, and I didn't fit in anywhere. So it was, I was going to combine all sorts of things about my identity. So about living in different countries and being like having different cultures, and then later it just, the focus became the gender identity, and that made it possible to make a book that you kind of have this one focus, and all the rest wasn't in there anymore, all the, it, because it would just be too much. But having started having started right out writing that story. Uh, meant that I was, it was like this purging experience and I used to be obsessed with how I grew up and that it was like something I didn't relate to other people, yeah. but I don't have that anymore. I never think about it. And in a way, this book kind of replaced my youth. Uh, like even though there's things in there that didn't happen and the other way around, I feel like I don't even really remember everything anymore. It's just kind of, I wrote yeah. this story and I think that's this really, really powerful thing that we can do as humans is write our own story. And you know it's it's okay if you don't like the story that you had. Like you can rewrite it and have that one. And now it's out there, and that's fine. And it's just very yeah. calming. And then it's like other people get to have like the catharsis. Like I mean, I remember being like I was fucking terrified when I was a teenager. Like mm -hmm. I uh, like I didn't know anything about like gender. I I cross dressed and like I'd go shop in like the men's section. And like when I was reading your book, just the image of like Jet's face pasted on Kurt Cobain's but, like if I had like if I had seen that, that would have saved me like two like years. I would have been like oh like 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 that's you know like I don't know you know. And it, it is like shit like that where it's like yeah like I get my own catharsis, but it's nice to be able to be like. Hey man, got some catharsis for you. It, it might, it might hit. I hope so. You know, I, I need that back. I'm just kidding. But, um, but yeah, I mean, it is nice that it's like, like I'm, I'm selfish. You know, like I'm doing it for myself. But then, like, when somebody comes up to me and it's like, I, uh, like, I don't know. You know, 
it's it's nice. Like I feel I don't know really any of you personally, but I feel like connect. Like I was talking to you too. Like I I feel connected from your work, and it is kind of like. Fuck, like when you're like a young person, you really think like you might die because you're like gay or trans or whatever. You're like, I'm gonna fucking die. And then you see like a book with like an alive person in it, and you're like, wow, this person made it far enough to make this book. Like, I gotta hang in there. You know, like, it's, it's gonna be okay, kid. Because all like that, it gets better. Like, I remember that, but like that felt like it's still like an ad campaign, you know what I mean? But when you see like a hand drawn like comic and it's something personal and you know, especially with like indie comics. Um, and I guess that's like a lot of my abrasion toward editors where it's like, I think editors a lot of times, like they want to take out that shit that's like the shit that like I want to see. Like the drunk mom, hey Arnold, I always, that's always the one I go to. It's like, um, you know, the, especially with like indie comics where it's like, it's not a fucking commercial product. It's just like, I don't know. I mean, I guess there's different editors and then that. Oh, yes, that, that, for that's sure, for sure. Like maybe they should have it because I think the important thing that editor can sometimes do is that you have this thing in your brain that you want to communicate. Yeah. And then like the trick is that the person who reads it reads what you had in yeah, your brain. Yeah, exactly. And sometimes like it's hard because yeah, you're, you're so into your own language in your own head and it just needs some tweaking for people to get it, what yeah. you said. Yeah. See, that's like, it's like I'm, like, I'm also kind of talking out my ass because I've never, the one, I had like one bad experience in like my early 20s where I pitched an early version of Star Valley and um, I never wanted the two main characters, uh, well, that's, I guess that's a spoiler shit, but I, 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 well, the person was like, you need to make a romantic storyline between these two characters, they've got to get together, you fucking know that shit, I mean, yeah, yeah. where it's like, you've got to get the characters together, you have, you know, yeah. could you possibly write a story about a 14-year-old boy and girl that don't get together at the end, you know, and that experience just like, really, really soured me, because I am like, like the characters are teenagers, but it's like I don't, I don't like all that like where it's like you have to write for this demographic and you need to do this for this, you know. And so it's like in creating understanding, like that rocks. That would actually be like super helpful. But I guess it's like if the editor's motivation is to like turn it into the best like commercial product to move units to like teenagers who would have bullied me. It's like nah, fuck that. Like, well, it's, it's funny you say that. <laughs> I'm so because, sorry. No, no, it's funny you say that because that was my literary. explicitly said to her, like, I don't want to work with an editor who will turn the three character, main characters in this book into a love triangle. Yes, and I yes, said, and I yeah. I don't want to work with an editor who will ask me to do that, and she said, you're not going to have to worry. And Hell she yeah. was right. There were a lot of people who were totally okay with the, the storyline the way I had it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because I think, really like, amazing. society often sees, like, a love story, like, when two people fall in love as kind of a validation, as, like, a success. Like, you as a person become a success once somebody chooses you. Oof. And that kind of, you know? Oof. <laughs> I, I, I had that issue with mine. Mine also started as a short zine, um, like a 16-page zine. And then, and then I realized, like, uh, it was almost, I did it with a little bit of fear. Like, I want this to be something people want to read, so it was really light and happy. And when I read it like a year later, I was like, I have to write what was actually going on then because I had my first like big rejection. So it's the opposite of what, you know, an editor might want. Like, ooh, they get together. No, it's not. <laughs> yeah, no. And, and but I was like, God, I wish I could have read something at that time that just talked about that, like realizing you like someone and then they don't like you. Yes, like, and exactly. I, and like, it not <laughs> ending with, and then they do at the end. I they love, see your true self. Yeah. Right. No, they didn't. I love when people feel like shit at the end. Like, <laughs> I love, like, a good, like, that's it. Enid gets on the bus, you know, and you're like, all right. Yeah. And when's the next one? The next yeah. shot yeah. of the bus in the distance. I want to feel bad yeah. again, you know? No. It just, don't spoil the ending. I'm just kidding. That's not oh, it. oops. I'm, I'm totally. Bruce kidding. Willis is a ghost. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> If you like endings that are kind of lackluster, I have really good news about real life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, the obvious flip, uh, flip side to that question, um, it, you know, what was in this for you is, uh, you know, editor tweaking aside, um, what did you deliberately include in this uh, for the audience and not for you? Like, specifically not for you. Like, maybe even something you found personally abrasive that you did. 
Hmm. Nothing, because I don't do things I don't want to do. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. That's not true. I mean, I, I don't know. That's tough, though. I mean, I don't, I don't know if I've ever... I mean, I guess like when it's like, what do I do for the audience? I mean, I guess I, I, I try to give enough clarity that they understand what's going on, but otherwise, like, I'm just playing with my dolls in my room and having a good time. You know, it's like I'm just giving them an, I'm giving them a door to walk into the room so they can watch my doll show, and you know, that's. It. Yeah, I don't know that I was worrying about. Yeah, I was doing it more for portraying the truth that I wanted to like put into the book, and then whether or not people related to that directly it sort of didn't matter because like if they related to it great then they would have some perspective that they you know were coming from that was similar to mine but if they had nothing in common with Jay or anything that happened to them at all then they would just learn about a kind of person that they had never encountered and they would hopefully have like greater empathy for um, you know if somebody was going through acne or whatever it's just like yeah. you know if you didn't have that yeah, experience when right. you were younger yeah. it's like well oh this is what someone was feeling because that's a very sort of internal experience and you don't know what that feels like when, if you never if you didn't have it so hopefully they have like a greater understanding of like oh my my friend who was probably having a really hard time and I didn't know so yeah I'm going to change my answer empathy is a good <laughs> yeah empathy <laughs> Um, empathy for sure for me it, showing anxiety I didn't really I mean I guess that's kind of for me but it's it's probably the hardest for me to communicate but it's the thing I want a reader to see the most just yeah. like how internally somebody on the outside might not obviously be showing what's going on on the inside same thing um, and especially because we're going towards a certain age group during that, it's sort of like streamlining that process is good just so uh, you're kind of guiding a younger audience. I never, that's why the editor thing is so helpful because I just, I don't know what is appropriate for sixth graders or like that age group. It's, it's hard to know what um, level you should go into things. Uh, I think that was helpful. Yeah, I don't, even though like now it turns out to be my book interesting for young adult also because it's protagonist is a teenager. I didn't particularly write the book for um, teenagers. It was yeah. definitely kind of just uh, just written. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. And um, the most important thing is for me, like I don't think I could go do any compromise. Like it has to be things that I want to do and I like. Mm -hmm. um, there was a point where I had worked on it for a really long time, rewritten it a long time. It, like I just started eight years ago. It was just kind of a long process um, because I, discovered I was trans, like I came out to myself why I was working on it. So it was just like um, a lot happening. Um, and so there was, a, there, there was a period when I didn't know if I was gonna find a publisher. I'd gotten rejected a lot and I had to ask myself the question, if nobody wants to publish it, am I still gonna make this book? And I realized, yeah, yeah. I, I'm yeah. still gonna do it. So um, I think that was also, sometimes like getting a lot of rejections and is, really useful as painful it is it is because you, you you come to this point where you have the i don't care enough to write what you need to write and like that was a good mindset to work on the book yeah. um so yeah I, I didn't put anything in there that i didn't want yeah <laughs> i think that's admirable actually <laughs> Uh, I think we have time for a Q and A. If anybody has questions, if you do, um, please feel free to step up to the microphones Ooh. down the aisles here, uh, so we can make sure to get you on camera. Yeah. Any questions from anybody? Nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> All has been answered. Actually, if there are no questions. I have one final one that's kind of a. Uh, Broad, but um, what about this? We have someone coming to the oh, mic. <laughs> Hello. Hey, everyone. Um, great panel so far. Really enjoying it. Um, it really, really was hard to remember my question. It's been so good. Um, but I guess I was wondering, how did you realize that you were going to write towards a younger audience? Um, I find that I don't really think of audience, I guess, when I'm writing, and yeah, you express that you don't really either, but you're still kind of making work, I guess, like at the end of the day that does end up with that audience. So 
when, how did you discover that that was even something you could do when it first started? Does that make sense? Yes. Cool. That totally makes sense. Um, I'd love to jump in. I think uh, for stories, it's much easier to write not worrying about the audience on like a zine, like something shorter. I found that to be much easier because I don't know the audience basically until the audience tells me <laughs> because I, it's harder to know what it'll appeal. Mm -hmm. um, but I found that like the first time I wrote the story, it was just so helpful to just write it for myself. But the second round, uh, having a little more intentionality mm -hmm. felt natural, so mm -hmm. that was for me. Yeah, similar to me, my initial, like when I did the mini comic version that was a memoir, I just like did it the way I thought was the best way to do it, get it out of my system. And uh, it was upon reflection because the, the mini comic I did was called uh, Memories of a Former Porcelain Doll. And the funny thing was, is when I put that out, so many people came back and told me, um, my experience was like, I had acne when I was much older, and, but so many people said they loved the mini comic and they related to it from when they were younger or yes. someone, they, either they were younger or someone in their life who was younger was going through it. And so when I was coming back around and talking with my agent about it, it was, I felt like I could reach more people that were going through that experience if I aged the book down. And I, because I had gotten sort of the memoir version out of my system, I felt like, okay, I have, I have all these pieces, all these timelines and um, anecdotes that I can think of that I can draw upon, and now I can make it into a more um, straightforward and like clear story. Um, so that's, that's how it happened for me. Yeah, um, I mean, I kind of like Coco was saying, I just made what I wanted to make. Um, like I, I still do, I get like bruised ego when people call it YA because it's like, they just are teenagers, but I'm like, you know, market category or whatever, but it's, um, you know, cause it's like, uh, how do I put it? Like I'll have like, sometimes like parents and kids will come up to the table and they're like, oh, is it for like teenagers? And I'm like, they talk like teenagers. <laughs> like they talk like teenagers and then the parent will open it up and look at it and then put it down and they walk away, which is fine. Um, but you know, like when I was like 14, like I was definitely not consuming media that was like age appropriate, you know? Um, so it's like, I just build it and then, I don't know, whoever shows up, shows up. Yeah, I, I, I think like YA as a genre, it's, it's also like a market thing. I think a lot yeah. of kids and young people are researching adults. Like they're reading adult stuff. They wanna know what kind of adult they're gonna be and they're, yeah, they're looking yeah, at yeah. YA researching stuff, adult. but they're looking it's at really a lot good. of like adult stuff too. So yeah. I don't know. And it's maybe like a way for libraries and to, yeah, to like, yeah. this is a this is what we concerned want you to read. Christian, yeah, like concerned Christian <laughs> yeah. parents. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I mean, I I love like comic subculture, and I have a lot of colleagues who constantly make things that nobody understands, and I think that's great. I don't think we are, we all need to be um, making these choices, and I um, I think for me it was kind of a practical choice. At some point, it's like a dream to make a book, and I kind of decided to get it together a little bit and <laughs> be a little bit more professional. Yeah. <laughs> and I really enjoyed it. It's just it's been really fun. Wow. Thank you. That was perfect. <laughs> Another question? Yeah. Oh, terrific. Um, so when you're writing autobiographical stuff or stuff from reality, do you ever deal with imposter syndrome of like, who am I to be telling the story? And if so, how do you deal with it? Um, I mean, uh, I don't know, God, I mean, whatever, it's just gonna make me sound like really sad, but like, like, I don't know, like, I got like, like growing up, like everything was sh like really not great. Like I got like bullied at school and like my parents, like who was home was like really mean to me. And I guess it just was like, if I don't do it literally, nobody else will. Like I, I, uh, where's the per? Oh, they sat down. I was gonna look at you, but I mean, it's it's really just like, I, because I used to feel more that way. Like, who am I to do this? And it's like, I, <laughs> I just turned thirty the other week, and I'm just like, I don't. Like, who am I? Like, I don't know. Like, who? Like, I have to do it for me. Like, nobody else did. Nobody else will. So. And I understand what you mean, like I, but you know, I don't try to like present myself as like the authority of like this is what it's like to grow up poor in the South with a bipolar dad. You know, somebody else might hit that like hit that out of the park better than me, but it's sort of like 
if someone bakes a better cake than me, then at least there's like two cakes for yeah. everyone to enjoy. Yeah. Yeah. Don't wait for things to be perfect to put them out there and like I think everybody feels it. Um, and then yeah. give it some space. <laughs> put it in a drawer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you'll never encapsulate like everyone's experience. So I think just like, you know, sticking to what you know is true for yourself and like this is my story and it may be very different for from someone else's experience, but I'm just gonna like stick to the truth of whatever that is. I think you can't go wrong and um, part, yeah, and part of the like imposter syndrome, I feel like it comes up more in terms of like this is such a long book, like how am I gonna like <laughs> pace myself to get all the way to the end because when I think about like all the work that goes into a graphic novel like it's it's really overwhelming so I really just try to like take it in small small yeah. chunks and like and, and going back to things that were said earlier just like the sincerity of knowing like this is a thing I have to do and I am excited to tell this story I think that really sustains you um, if you're like doubting um, you know why you're doing it or if you should do it um, if you like really want to if it's something you're really excited to work about, I think that will sort of get you through to the end of it. Yeah. Um, and we want to read your comics, so it's that thing of like, whatever the story, people people want to hear your experience, so, uh, you know, make it, please. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I, the imposter syndrome stuff comes up, but I'd much rather hold a zine in my hand at the end of the day than worry about if anyone's going to relate to it. If not, they'll just humor me and read it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Well, that's all the time we've got. I'm so sorry. Um, Yoris, Audra, Jared, Coco, thank you so much for a really good conversation. And if you could just, starting with yours, um, let everybody know where you're tabling. Oh, oh yeah. Um, I think W's 76, and I'll be signing in half an hour. All right. so. um, I'm at W17A. <laughs> I'm at k 6 uh, I'm Coco. I'm at L7. <laughs> it's a, like a little square. <laughs> <laughs> hey, well, thank you so much. That Bye. Thank you.